Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, we are going to have a quick presentation slash debate between Cecilia Aragon and Michael Bernstein on the dystopian and utopian views of crowdsourcing. Um, and then we're going to have a few people from the audience that we asked uh, to come up and kind of we're going to assign them either a dystopian side or a utopian side and kind of debate among them. Uh, so we're going to start with Cecilia and then Michael is going to talk about All right. Thanks, Andres. So when Andres and Michael first approached me to be on the other side of the debate, I thought, okay. I decided I was going to take this a little bit literally and present a dystopian view, so I wrote a science fiction story. It takes me eight minutes to read it, so I'm going to read it out loud with this old-fashioned technology. Um, but before I start, I wanted to just give my background. I mean, so I actually started out as a, as a crowd worker. Um, I became disabled um, some years ago, and I actually worked on Amazon Mechanical Turk for a little bit found I couldn't make enough money on that. I mean, I was in a wheelchair and I was told I would never walk again. Um, but I actually survived by uh, going to eBay and buying and selling a particular type of doll. <laughs> so, all right, so on with the story. I was born in debt. Well, all children are nowadays in the 2070s. It costs money to install an Oracle RFID to install a Google Eye. The surgery is delicate on a newborn, but it has to be done. How else would you survive? There's no way to connect to the net, no way to work, no way to earn your living, no way to pay for food, water, air. Since the taxation ban of 2041, signed into law by the first World Bank president, a fundamental tenet of our Constitution has been that no free citizen should be required to pay for another's upkeep. We are all free to make our own future, to live without the onerous burden of providing for someone else too lazy to work. So as kids, we start getting out of debt as soon as possible. We're lucky that with the passing of the Children's Freedom Act of 2049, co-sponsored by the oil senators, we're now legally allowed to work from birth. I was four when I worked my first hit. My parents were so proud of me. They told me my debt counter had gone down for the first time in my life. They pointed out the blinking red numbers on my wrist, but I didn't really understand yet. All I knew is that I'd flicked my eye over the dasher, just like I'd been practicing, and I typed in the blurry numbers I read from the image captcha on my eye screen. 60 seconds of work, and it earned me my first dollar. My mom smiled for the first time that week and took me into her warm arms for a big hug, and my dad tapped my head with his knuckle, saying, this cocote works. My debt counter, which had barely reached a mega counter by then, had taken its first downward step. The first of many, I vowed. When I was old enough for kindergarten, every day I would skip down the hall from our cube to the elementary school on corridor B6, scan my wrist RFID at the big blue door, get it debited for my daily education charge, and join 100 kids from our neighborhood sitting at Carol's learning to read, I type, do math, and program, the four R's, or if we were lucky, playing on the shaggy orange rug in front of the window. Just like all the other kids, I loved pressing my nose up to the window and looking out over the city. As far as the eye could see, tall buildings speared up into the pale brown sky until their edges were lost in the distance, shimmering in the heat. The sun glared down like an old-time furnace, and you could feel its searing blaze even through the thick filtered plexiglass. Every now and then, an outside worker in all their protective gear would come rattling down the, past the glass, waving at the children who clustered around in excitement. I'm going to work outside when I'm grown, bragged Willie, a tall boy whose debt counter was, amazingly, below a mega dollar. Kim sniffed. 
You'll never be able to afford the gear, she scoffed. Nobody looked at her. Everyone knew Kim had the highest debt counter in the class. How she would dig herself out of that hole, enough to qualify for a loan on the hugely expensive outside gear, especially when everyone knew she was behind on her hit homework, was pretty much impossible. She didn't work enough hits fast enough even to pay for her own education, much less start slowing her debt counter's ballooning growth. But still, we all had big dreams. Don't all kindergartners have them? I worked all my hit homework and then some, studiously avoiding the game tab on my eye until I had surpassed my goal for the day. Still, my debt counter crept slowly upward. School, food, oxygen, all took their daily bites out of those numbers on my wrist. I just wasn't good enough at six years old to work the higher paying hits. But I played the hit lottery every day, dreaming of working that magical hit that would make me a big winner. Play the Amazon lottery. It only takes one hit to win. Imagine your debt counter and that of your entire family being reset to zero. You too could join these lucky winners in the world of green numbers. The images of laughing families proudly displaying their wrists with those astonishing winking green of the rich flashed across my eye, and I sighed and closed my eyes to work faster. I would be rich one day. Anyone could be rich if they worked hard enough, if they earned a high enough rating to qualify for the more lucrative hits. Of course, you had to be careful. At six years old, Kim had already been blacklisted by many of the major corporations for doing poor quality work. If her rating kept getting lower, she wouldn't have a chance to ever get out of debt. And even worse, she might be crowd shunned, blacklisted by other workers who wouldn't want to work a team hit with her. Once you were crowd shunned, that was it. There was no chance of turning the numbers around. When she turned 18 and couldn't stay with her parents anymore, she would be kicked out of their cube and sent to one of the lower floors, where they couldn't afford to pay for hallway air conditioning and where the oxygen levels were low. I'd been there on field trips, seen the people slumped in hot, dim corners, their wrists blinking red with unimaginably high numbers, and returned with a headache from lack of oxygen, sweaty and scared. But I was going to be rich. Not only would I be rich, I would be an employee one day, actually drawing a salary from JP Morgan or Comcast or Microsoft. <laughs> My favorite net show was Green Employees, a sitcom about a group of friends who worked in one of the domes, who played games on real grass, swam in pools and had private toilets, who actually drew a salary every week that made their green numbers go up. The main character was a kid who had once been just like us, just like me. He lay in his slot at night with the panel closed and worked hits until he fell asleep. The villain of that show was a terrorist who had once been the friend of the main character when they were kids, but he had tried to get the workers of the neighborhood to organize to refuse to work hits they said that he said paid too little. But that made the requesters complain that if their labor costs went up too high, they would go out of business and stop creating jobs. They started withholding hits to that neighborhood. So the other workers crowd shunned the terrorist, and he ran away, hiding somewhere in the city and trying to sabotage net access for his former classmate. The main character was always getting in trouble because he had a soft spot for his terrorist friend. As I caught the latest episode, I grimaced at the antics of the main character as I stood in line for the toilet in the morning. When I grow up, I'll never act like that. After all, I'm from an upper middle class family and we have a responsibility to those less fortunate. <laughs> So uh, this is called 45 million. Uh, 45 million human lives. Um, that's what labor economists have estimated 
are the stakes of what we're looking at and what we're talking about here. So I think when we have thought largely about crowdsourcing and crowd work, we've really framed it in this very micro-tasky way. Even all the way up to some of the more advanced platforms you, we are talking about on the order of like a few days at, at most of what people are, are contributing to. It's this micro-tasky movement. It's relatively limited in its framing. And you know, nowhere is, I think, this more visible than on platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk. You know, it's been an incredible boon to many requesters for data collection, for cleaning, uh, for research, but it's also, as I think Lily Irani has put it really well, hidden a lot of the workers inside of, inside of a steadily humming computation infrastructure, right? So there's this infrastructure of people now, not just technology. But I, when we are talking about the future of crowd work, I think this view is actually much too narrow. When I, when I look ahead, what I see is a, is a vision for the future of work. It's complex and it's interdependent work. It's people coming together on demand, at scale, elastically, and to tackle complex problems. We've seen this achieve some incredible things with peer production, with Wikipedia, with open source software. And I think what we want to think about is, where could this go if it went well? Just to give a sense of that kind of vision, my group has been thinking about things like, take a napkin sketch of a design, pull together a group of experts off of platforms such as Odesk or elsewhere, computationally gather them and guide their efforts, and pull together a working mock of your design in about 24 hours. Computationally, all we've done is brought these people together and coordinated their efforts. The 24 hours is just because we've been able to pull them together in an effective way. Or maybe we take a, a prompt, we bring together other workers computationally, and we're able to pull together in about now 48 hours an entire animated video. Or we can take multiple groups of these, of these participants, combine them with, for example, videos, education experts, uh, and, excuse me, and software developers to create an entire platform, say if you wanted to build your own MOOC competitor, again, in about a day. And all of these things are really fascinating because at some level, they're being modulated by computation. They're growing, the teams are growing and shrinking on demand. They're able to be recombined like Lego blocks. And we can even pull together teams that have never previously existed by looking at little independent pieces of other teams that we can, that we can wire together. This is work led by Daniela Rotelny oh, with my group here at Stanford. And so this future is technologically mediated. I think this, this is why we can create and fashion it. We as technologists and designers can rethink its core tenets, right? The markets are no longer somewhere else. We, in this room, have the ability to actually envision what that future of work will look like. And I think if we do nothing, if we do nothing, then that dystopian view that Cynthia point, uh, pointed out will come true. So I think that we have not only the opportunity, but the responsibility as designers and creators to think about what a productive future would look like. Liz Gerber, who's in the room, and a few others of us put it this way. What might you design if you knew that your own child would grow up to, be just, to, to sit on a panel like, they, like there was this morning? Would you feel comfortable with that right now? And if not, what do we need to do between here and that time period to make it happen? Right? We might think about what, what might we design as a future of reputation? Right? right now, I can say I went to Stanford or I work for Google. But when you're on a platform like Odesk, that kind of thing simply doesn't work so easily. Here are a couple examples from Odesk and nothing against Giannis. Um, but I think we have a, a while to go. I see this as a huge opportunity. Anytime anyone is uh, advertising their skills using all caps, I start to get a little worried. But we can think, what should reputation look like in the future? What might education look like? Right now, people are thinking about uh, just tossing out video lectures online with automated quizzes. I've myself participated in some of this work. But could we enable people to actually work on real needs to support their learning? Could there be work studies, micro internships, things that allow people to learn better or more effectively? Could we create such a future? Collective action, my student Nilafar, who spoke earlier, has I think started to think about this. What happens when your entire set of people who might join your union or your collective are turning over at such a rate that they can never even come together and make a collective decision. What might that future of collective action look like when mediated by the internet? And what could we design? And again, staring at Giannis, who is a, 
<laughs> a lot of investment in a platform. But I wonder, could we collectively do better? Could we create the next platform, one that gives voice to the workers and helps them overcome the years of social science research that demonstrates uh, the kinds of struggles that we have and the kinds of how poor our intuitions are at thinking about how we organize people and draw them together and get them uh, and, and help ourselves get things done. So I think when I view a potentially utopian outcome for crowd work, I'm thinking not just about crowdsourcing, I'm thinking about work. I'm looking, I'm reading the tea leaves and seeing that all work or a lot of work might eventually be digitally mediated. So what happens when it grows up from micro tasks to something where, where we are doing creative, analytical, and engineering work, and many of us are doing it, and it's normal, right? Could we make that something that we are proud, that we are, uh, proud to say that we helped create? Yeah. So now we have the sort of uh, interesting part of this. We've tapped, I think, six individuals. If we've talked to you, can you come up here? So while Cecilia and I started this debate, we're not going to end it. All right, so I've got a coin. Thank you, Nate. Uh, so one, two, three. If this is heads, you're going to be arguing a utopian view. If this is tails, you're going to be arguing a dystopian view. And the opposite over here. Well, we, we don't know yet. Heads. So this side is arguing a utopian view. This, uh, this side is arguing a dystopian view. This side? Yeah. And we're basically just here to help moderate. Uh, you have a mic for them. I'll give you the mic. So we, en we encourage for this to be, uh, to be interactive. So we need to prod them with questions. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Right here. All right. Hold it here. So I will hand you the mic. Can we get a first question? I can, I can give a statement. All right, let's make a statement. Okay, so this is the utopian view. So I, I'd like to address this from the workers' experience. So, um, you know, there's been criticism that people that work on... Um, I'm sorry, could you speak up? My, my Google ear is not installed because I couldn't afford it, so I just... So, a so there, there's been criticism that, uh, that uh, crowdsourcing dehumanizes work, people have a, workers have a lack of identity. Um, this is really a positive thing because, you know, it, it enables people to not tie their identity to the workplace. You can go out, you can have, have a life, you can have a personal life with a, with a real identity. Um, there's also the, the criticism that crowdsourcing, um, it decontextualizes work. So people, uh, you know, they're working in small tasks and they don't have a sense of the whole and they can't get gratification and fulfillment. That's completely wrong because there's so much research that shows that routine work is very satisfying. And by working on these, these small bits, it, it removes the pressure from people to have to worry about the larger picture. They just have to worry on that, that small task and think of all the stress that this relieves. Well, th that makes some sense, except with the global cast ranking that you start with and you can't ever get away from, um, it makes it very difficult because the, the tasks that, that I have to do being at the untouch of the lowest of the untouchable ranking, that I was born into that and there's no way of me ever getting out of that. So I won't ever be able to find any, any kind of micro task that's even remotely fulfilling. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, is it? Um, so in terms of some of the things that you can develop, though, I mean, yeah, like you start with micro tasks, but uh, with so many different tools out there to actually help you maximize your performance over time, in terms of your micro tasks, you can actually uh, create strategies and plans that will enhance your performance and hopefully get you to those more uh, better paying tasks. Um, I mean, in the future, it's quite possible that all of us will have achieved a level of data literacy. I'm required by status to be down here. Uh, I've also broken my back. <laughs>
because I've been, my physical body has decayed because I've been staring at the computer screen for so long. Gotcha. <laughs> you don't have health insurance. And I don't have health insurance. Yeah. Um, I'm also having, I was having a hard time comprehending what you were saying because I, I, I haven't had a lot of education. Um, so, um, and I haven't been deemed worthy of having that level of education because my DNA, 23 in me, told me that I was only capable of so much. Um, so I guess I don't, ha I don't have anything to say. So if, you, if I might step back from this kind of fictional context, um, like access to labor is really important. And a lot of the dystopian stories are actually experienced by people today. Like this dystopian story is basically what would happen if middle class people suddenly were faced with the constraints that most of the people in the world have, um, you know, around limits of education, limits of resources, uh, the like day jobbing problem. Like these are all things that people right now like are making life and death differences for people. Like my dad grew up in the Western Highlands of Guatemala, no electricity, no running water. Like these are things that matter to people and like it's possible, right, that the outcome of crowd labor and microtasking might be to kind of extend like precarious labor more widely across the economy. But it's also possible that it could also extend work opportunities to vast numbers of people who haven't had those opportunities. And if you look at organizations like Samasource that actually offer crowd work to people um, who otherwise would have you know, difficulties having access to the opportunities to learn how to use computers and use them gainfully. Like there's a huge amount of work being done to broaden like access to labor for people who couldn't otherwise like actually um, like, like experience social mobility and advance in the world. And I think that it's going to be important to work on both sides of this to expand this access as well as contend as we've seen wonderfully with uh, the like various projects we've seen here with the employers just like the labor movement has over the years. So I'm going to um, jump into a particular part of this dystopian future with crowdsource work and that's what I kind of got at with my question um, which is breaking it down into um, I actually was a target of crowdsourced revenge a few years ago. Um, I wrote a story that somebody didn't like uh, and they took my cell phone number and put it into a Craigslist uh, uh, casual encounters ad along with my Facebook photo. And um, so all these people started calling me because they thought I was like down to have sex in downtown Manhattan um, and I couldn't use my phone all day long because it was apparently those ads really work. I got a lot of calls and a lot of text messages. And this is something that's been, um, this idea of crowdsourced revenge has happened a lot on Craigslist, um, much worse than in my, in my experience of it. Um, but uh, uh, like people saying, um, uh, uh, putting up an ad for somebody else um, to fulfill a rape fantasy um, encounter. Um, so this is something that we're already starting to see with Mechanical Turk and um, Freelancer, another crowdsource site, where people use them to, um, uh, to uh, commit fraud. Um, so basically you have people solve CAPTCHAs um, or send spam or try to place malware and they don't know what they're doing. So um, when you are doing this discrete task and you don't know the whole, there are um, basically nefarious or bad things that you might be encouraged to do and you, you'll have no idea. Can, can I address Nathan's point, which is I appreciate your optimism. However, I just walked here in this very wealthy city and passed at least 30 homeless people sleeping on cardboard boxes. And I think if we can't figure this, if we can't figure out systems here, why in the, like, why in the hell would we care about figuring out what's happening to people behind screens? And these people are, I saw them, I looked in their eyes. So I, I'm, I'm not optimistic about what we're capable of actually doing. So I actually want to, you know, 
say thank you to Nathan for saying that. And I want to address that specifically. My partner is a cook. He works for $11 an hour. He has no benefits. He wouldn't be able to afford to live on a day-to-day -day basis if he didn't live with me. Right? He would love to have TaskRabbit in our town as a way to be able to increase his income. And he would love to have more opportunities to be able to say, I have a range of skills so that if this one isn't going to do it, maybe other ones can. That's a real world right now yeah. problem that's solvable if these systems are more broadly available. Um, and I, you know, I like some of what Michael was saying about, you know, how can we think about this? Yeah, how can we fix the system, make it better, rather than saying it's just a bad thing? I mean, we are all so privileged sitting here. We're all saying, well, this crowdsourcing thing is so different from this really good thing that I have. But there are all these people sitting in the middle. They're not homeless. But they're, they're absolutely in need of a better system than what we have. And they're not all going to get tenured professorships, right? They're not all going to have full-time jobs with all of the benefits. So how you. do we make these <laughs> systems better to provide support for them rather than dismissing them as dystopian, dismissing them as dehumanizing? Instead of dismissing them, how can we make them better? Because I would like to be able to say that if one of my kids did this, that that wouldn't be a depressing thing for me, that that could be an enabling thing, that that could mean that they have better choices. So, you know, I, it, it's easy to dismiss it in a broad dystopian way, but I think there, there are bigger and more important questions and ways for us to think about making it better instead of just saying it's bad. Let's let, yeah, let's let the pass around yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Cecilia, pass can you hand it to me? Yeah. You can hold it. So I, I love this conversation yeah. because I think it's raising some of the really important underlying issues. And you know, I also agree that when viewed from an individual perspective, what uh, Liz and Nathan have said is absolutely true, that we have to recognize the potentially expansive and empowering access that these platforms are providing. But I think what I'd like to surface a little bit more in the conversation is what I think Michael was alluding to is the responsibility of our organizations and collectives, because ultimately that's where the rubber's going to hit the road. So is this new trend in crowdsource work giving license to our organizations to create, you know, less protections for workers to, uh, you know, really capitalize on the precariousness of the work. Um, we're already seeing it. I'm sure people are seeing it in corporate. I mean, I don't know what's happened to temp agencies, for example, but, you know, in the academy, we've already seen this progress towards um, the destabilization, the growing insecurity of work with, you, with the advent of things like uh, MOOCs and all of these other things, the crowdsourcing of education, the lack of security for, um, you know, tenure is probably going to be gone in the next generation of uh, academic um, labor. And not that we want to hold on to the old modernist notions of labor necessarily, but I think it's really incumbent on the new platforms to really fulfill the role that our historical organizations have provided in giving, you know, some level of uh, responsibility to taking care of certain aspects of work. One of the things that struck me in this conversation is the, um, I guess, the conflation of labor with like one cent digital tasks. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is how these platforms, like. My introduction to Amazon Mechanical Turk was through Mary Gray's work. Um, she's at Microsoft Research and, and thinking about like the really low paying, like what she calls digital piecework and that kind of grunt work. But if we think about the um, Steve who was in front of us earlier, I mean, he's making it like he makes more money than I do for sure. Like $50 an hour is a lot of money to be doing physical tasks. And I think, you know, one of the things that Liz brought up is, is um, the the type of work that is is compensated not just behind screens. So I think one of the things that we need to think about in the future is how is the nature of crowd work and whether it's just behind screens or if it's, you know, I hate to talk about the online offline divide, but like how what what is crowd work exactly and like how how are we crowding and and how is that sourced and and all of that. Uh Giannis? Oh, and then Liz, sorry. Yeah, so I I, I wanted to also like I would use sort of like a different subject, which is uh, how in organizations and how organizations like think about work in general. And 
whether this is, good, is going to be the future or the future something else. So like one of the things what we talk about is how uh, we live in this bubble and Silicon Valley companies, <clears throat> they compete for talent. They're, they're willing to pay amazing amounts of money <clears throat> to people just to sort of like come and move here and work for them, where at the same time there are all these people out there which are equally uh, 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 skilled that can uh, sort of like work remotely. So, so like, I, 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 I come from Greece. I, my, my best friend was getting married over Christmas. I couldn't go there. Uh, there is no reason why I should have been here and I, I wasn't able to like to work from Greece. Uh, right? So I think also switching the conversation into how organizations are structuring uh, work and uh, there are there are sort of like there is the Silicon Valley, the Bay Area thing where you have to move here and uh, you have to get these high salaries. Everybody has to compete about it, but at the same time you can do it in a different way. And so like some of the things. Uh, uh, that we need to start thinking about is how organizations themselves uh, think about work. And, and there are some things where you need people uh, to be locally, but there are many other things where uh, this is just because of, of the culture. Uh, there's no uh, actual requirement for it. So I really wanted to say thank you for bringing this together. And it seems that we have a call to action here because there's a different kind of piecemeal activity that goes on, which is the academic piecemeal activity of small bits of work that don't get threaded together. And specifically, I think what you've got here is a really nice action for platforms where a lot of the CSCW Chi kind of work can come together with a focus. Mary's just presented some beautiful work, which was an intern project, but actually could be a much bigger project around accessibility through literacy as well, which Dan was talking about yesterday. And like my dream was to help Dan make that problem better. Um, I think there's a lot of people in our communities for whom the application in a systematic way of the small pieces of work could come together in collaboration with platforms like yours to really bring value. Another, I don't know if there's anyone here who's working on reputation systems. Until recently, I was at eBay and working with a lot of economists and computer scientists to think about what is the right model for reputation between sellers and buyers. Um, I myself did a lot of field work in the summer with interns on how do our sellers actually reach our buyers and how do they represent themselves and what happens when algorithms prefer big box retailers and push your search results down. What happens when that happens, right? And a lot of these little pieces of work could come together very nicely in this particular agenda if we can be systematic about pulling them together rather than doing them individually and publishing them as separate CHI papers and CSEW papers and whatever. And if we can partner with platforms like yours to really say what are the consequences of these abstract research activities in the whole if we are more programmatic about it. And so, Michael, thank you. Andresh, thank you. Because I think what we have here is a potential really kind of systematic agenda that we can use Liz's methodology to sit around in a circle and say, what are you going to bring to this as a bigger systematic agenda that we can actually start talking to each other about bigger consequences of our work than a Kai CSCW paper or a blog post? End of rant. Um, so I was going to say that uh, to respond to, um, I'm not sure, but res respond to Liz's uh, quip about uh, seeing homeless people on the streets and all these different societal problems. The thing is that it's not an either or situation. It's not like we can trade in one, one work world for another work world. In my mind, at least, this is going to happen. And so the question is whether you step in and whether you have interventions. Um, we keep talking about in independent contracting as a status. It's things like, well, if the employee paradigm is shifting a lot into this independent contractor paradigm, then what sort of protections need to be there for independent contractors? If we're talking about uh, dynamic workforces where you can pull together a team to build a product in a day, how do you make sure that that team continues to accrue wealth rather than the original person being the only one to accrue wealth, right? Like, if you're only selling your labor, you're never going to get ahead. Um, so those are some of the things to consider. Also, another thing is like um, what the woman who used to work at eBay was saying, um, Liz, wait, Elizabeth. Elizabeth um, 
is that there are actually a lot of people who are interested in this area, not just academics, and we have to kind of consider who are the various stakeholders in this area. Um, I work for city government, and I think one of the things that people often forget or otherwise often overemphasize are people who are low income and in disadvantaged uh, situations, and there's such a myopic view of like, how do we help these people, which on a certain level is kind of paternalistic, but on another level is like, this is actually a result of income inequality rather than being a low income issue. And to address these sort of inequalities, you don't just start from the bottom up, like as in bottom up being like the lowest classes up, um, you actually have to address the whole system. So yeah, it's just, it's basically that even if it's something that we don't want to come, like it's going to happen, and the question is whether we're going to go out there and create some inter interventions. Um, yeah, so I just want to come in on a couple of the things here, and everyone appears to be called Liz, so I'm sorry if I get the wrong Liz. But um, <laughs> uh, um, I think what I want to talk about a bit is um, uh, sort of visible versus invisible dystopias a little bit. Like, um, you know, like many people here, I've had a fairly privileged background. You know, I've had parents with some money and, and a decent education. Um, despite that, you know, at various times when I abandoned my PhD and ran off to try and join the web circus, you know, I had to get some badly paid jobs like you do when you run out of money. So I've worked in, in supermarkets, you know, I've pushed trolleys around, I've worked in warehouses and supermarkets, I've worked in temp agencies, two years in temp agencies, till I was trying to find this kind of stuff. And I just like to say, these jobs are incredibly degrading and they're already here. You know, they, they, these people treat you, your, your, your employers treat you as if you are essentially nothing you know you're 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 just you are labor uh you know the amount of times i had someone in some uh realty office say to me like is this really all you want to do with the rest of your life like write letters and print them out five times on different color bits of paper and i was like well <laughs> patently no that's an obviously stupid thing to say but i think that the interesting thing about this is that we we don't we don't notice that as much as we notice this new technology that comes along with a new pattern so you know, we don't notice on a daily basis that pretty much everything we live and wear and use is made by incredibly badly paid labor overseas. We don't, we don't somehow notice that, you know, the people who surround us who do these jobs around us in supermarkets, in fast food, food joints and everything are incredibly badly paid and have very few opportunities. Uh, so I find it kind of, kind of bizarre that we would look at this kind of new uh, emerging scenario and go, this is somehow dehumanizing. This is somehow worse in a way than no job or these terrible jobs that already exist. The, the factors that come in, the important things are the individual companies. Are they treating people decently? And the, and the state, what we approve of as a country or as a culture and what we put into law to protect people. These are the things that actually matter. The, um, the, the, the specific mechanism of the work, I don't see anything any more dehumanizing about TaskRabbit or any of these things than I do about working stacking shelves in a supermarket every day without choice, without opportunity, without flexibility. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I particularly need to contribute anything else, but I'm sort of a bit fired up, so I want to. And I think there are sort of two Silicon Valley hacks. One is to talk about the inevitability of stuff, and everyone's doing, oh, this is going to happen, you know. No, not everything is inevitable. And then the second one is to talk about everything as completely new. Um, and I think some of this is what Tom was touching on, but this is a new way of work. Actually, it's not. When I look at what's presented, they're just temp agencies. And temp agencies have been around for a very long time. The difference is they're subject to labor laws and they don't try to resist that anymore. Um, and so that means that they are responsible for paid leave for people who are doing temp work for them. So it's not the companies that are getting temps that have to pay for the leave it's the temp agency looks at the work that's done and sort of does that um, has a responsibility for healthcare and other contributions and so these two great hacks to say it's inevitable so we don't need to question the premise of it and then it's new so all of these existing labor laws and sort of models don't apply is absolutely genius and it works all the time um, but it's really irritating and I just think um, a group like this that is so much more critical should try not to fall into those two kind of um, rhetorics. I, I am on. Um, I just want to say my small intervention. For most of us in this room, we live in countries where good jobs are the exception. 
right? So the jobs that we have are the exception, not the rule. And so that seems to be in some ways missing from this conversation where we're talking about a set of jobs that um, are on a spectrum of collapsing middle class wages, right? So 40% of US adults say they cannot get $2,000 for an emergency. 40% cannot get just $2,000 if they have a car accident, a health insurance problem, a medical emergency. What are the ways that we're thinking not about smaller platforms and technological systems, but sets of arrangements that allow us to reconceive what is paid work and how we do it. The idea of thinking about TaskRabbit outside of a larger historical trajectory of what's been going on in 19th and 20th century Western labor markets, to me seems absurd because some things are new, the technology, the structures behind the ways people are getting paid are very old and they're very problematic and have been for years. Yeah. Hello. Oh, it's it's extremely directional, it turns out. Uh, threading together a few of the, the recent comments, just thinking out loud, one thing that might be particularly fueling both the fire and the worry here is that I feel this is intervention that has already happened in many, many domains. And in a sense, what's happening is that it's now occurring to information work, which is us in many ways. And, and, and I wonder if that's what's firing a lot of both the sort of enthusiasm and the worry. Um, and maybe if we can identify with the rest of our own humanity around what's working well and doesn't work well and what we need to do, it will help us ease this transition if it occurs or if not um, more, more readily. Um, so it, it, this is kind of a, more of a question than a comment. Uh, along the li same lines of talking about labor, and I was just wondering if this is going to kind of um, change what is more valuable as labor and what is not. Like, is are we going to at some point think that okay, this kinds of jobs are going to now start becoming less valuable, and you get paid for it less and less, and um, for other kinds of jobs more and more. I guess the first thing just echoes what Tom and. Fiona said, which is, on some levels, you know, we should probably all go back and read Of Mice and Men and just think about it as, God, yes. imagine that, but like at a distance. Um, the other one is that civil society, civil society in the service of a polity, by definition, has to operate in the abstract. Like, we're trying to organize a heterogeneous body of people in a general direction, which is loosely labeled opportunity, which, you know, means different things to different people. You know, we could have public sector organizations that get in your junk and be like, well, you need to do this to make money, you know, I mean, and on some levels, that's the sort of dystopian work model. I think government says two plus two equals five all the time in the service of a public good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing, you know, if, if we just fall prey to the inevitability of our own worst instincts, I mean, <laughs> Pretty much everyone in this room is fucked. <laughs> um, I, I have one, uh, yeah, from, not from the dystopian or from either side, but it, but it seems to me that this is a great group to think about the role of culture in all of this. And that with, if, if we had a culture of, of pro worker, of, if we had a culture of health, if we had a culture of, of um, what was possible, if we looked at the, the things that we know that make, that make work meaningful, and if those could be baked into these platforms so that you felt like rather than doing a single disaggregated tiny piece that you knew that it was part of something bigger, that you in some way could, could be a part of that you feel like you've got some meaning, so a culture of meaning, but the, but the role of culture in this, all of this conversation I think is really important. Um, I wanted to add something super practical, which is I'm at the sabbatical center this year, um, and there's actually a funded uh, research project going on about the future of work and workers in which they're bringing together a lot of social scientists and policymakers, and they're doing a, a massive survey that's been funded 
of what these kinds of people who do have the kind of data about the system uh, are thinking is going on, including these trends. So, so if anybody really you know wants to follow, I'm mean, thinking Michael, you probably already know about that initiative. I hope it's Margaret Levy doing it. But if not, I mean, let me know because there there literally is a, a distributed survey going on right now to try to ask some of these questions towards envisioning future practice. I I just want to say. Uh, Really quickly, back to the utopian view. Um, I mean, there there are real world examples of how crowdsourcing has solved uh, problems. For example, uh, reCAPTCHA has helped Google Books with optical character recognition. Inocentive has uh, helped companies solve real world problems. And I feel that we haven't really. Um, uh, reach the potential of what we can with crowdsourcing in society. For example, you know, why rely on diplomats to do peace negotiations? Why don't we do crowdsourcing to solve world peace? I just want to make a quick comment about what people get paid for the same labor, essentially. Um, I was going to say there are technology platforms of transparency out there, like um, Glassdoor. I nearly said glass ceiling. And that brought me to the second thing, which is that we know that jobs very frequently are very gendered. And so when women come into the workforce and get paid, they often get paid less, typically, for the same labor. I loved your example about, you know, I put up 15 and 500 an hour, and then I saw what happened. I think, again, back to the excitement I have for us working on some of these technologies, the technologies of transparency are often around, what can I ask for this work? Um, when I'm talking to my girlfriends about jobs, we've started sharing what we get paid because we know that there is not parity, gender parity. That kind of transparency, I think, is really, really important. So thank you for bringing that one up. So I just want, I want to make a couple of quick points. I mean, first of all, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Daniela Rosner, has written a really nice piece on crowdsourcing design and what can happen there. Um, there's a, there, not everything... I mean, th there's a whole different set of things. Some things can be crowdsourced better than others. Crowdsourcing design tends to result in mediocrity. And the other point I want to make is that companies now are going to have to start, um, there, there have been lawsuits, right? Who, have people here heard about the lawsuit against Crowdflower, which was successful, right? Michael knows about this. Yeah, I mean, so um, workers sued Crowdflower for not paying minimum wage and, it, and won a settlement for it. And so it, it, this is happening. But again, I think, I think the answers that people have brought up, you know, we need to think of policy, culture, you know, we, we need, there, there need, you know, we need to legislate it. I mean, this is, a system will not grow naturally. It's, you know, it, it needs to be guided, right, by hopefully wisdom. So I hope that, yeah, that we can all be part of that discussion. I mean, this is not my research area, but I'm just interested in it, so. Yeah, so I, I wanted to pick up on this theme percolating about, you know, the fact that uh, work and labor is not reducible to work that's monetized. So I think that's also very important to keep the overall spectrum of if you consider work and labor to be contributions to society, whether they're monetized or not, the crowdfunding platform, crowdsource work platforms are interesting because they're kind of dealing with the monetization in a new way, but this is also happening in parallel with platforms that allow for contributions to collective value, which are not monetized, which of course have been talked about a lot, but need to be looked at in parallel. So when I do research with young people who are uh, systematically excluded from the monetized labor market, they're actually extremely enthusiastic contributors to non-monetized forms of labor, which actually are very interesting places for the kind of collective action and education and things that Michael is advocating that the monetized platforms also address. But I think those things need to be looked at in parallel. And I've been doing a set of interviews with young people who have recently graduated from college and are confronting a really shitty labor market. And often they're highly educated, creative class kind of kids, and they're Uber drivers, they're doing TaskRabbit and so on so that they can continue to be artists and do non-monetized forms of work. So there are ways in which you know, the dehumanizing aspects of certain forms of work you know, pragmatically are being balanced by the fact that, okay, what you do for money may be different from what you do for love, and we may be encountering a different landscape for how people navigate that opportunity. Thank you. 
And so it's uh, four, five past noon, and so lunch is here. But first, I want to thank Cecilia, all of you for being here, and especially Michael Bernstein, who helped this. Thank you.